This is Under the Cross Swords, a podcast series from Mosquita Nautica. In this episode, we tell the first part of the story of Morris Fricker, most commonly known as Biff, but also known in the service as Badge. Biff was Mick Fricker's brother, whose service story we hear covered in an earlier episode. A couple of times we served on the same vessels. He was a, it was an MFE we took up to um, Cyprus, and he was the skipper of that. The brothers got on really well and served together on several occasions, but they were like chalk and cheese in terms of personality. Biff being very academic and straight in his approach to work and life, and Mick being a bit more of a lad and a risk taker, as both Mick and Biff's son, Dave, attest to. Well, he was one of these fellows who was as straight as a die, never did anything wrong in his career, exemplary um, conduct and all the rest of it. Biff's account is expectedly thorough and detailed, and was written whilst he was still alive with the assistance of Dave. We have divided the account into three parts. This part covers his early life and career. There is a short episode giving the full details of the infamous Armentiers incident. And then part two covers the latter part of his water transport career. It has to be said that even these barely scratch the surface of Biff's fascinating career, but give a taster of one of the key characters who appears time and again throughout this series and in other people's stories. Biff's own words are voiced by his son Dave for this recording. My father's childhood memories of the sight of the then poverty-stricken old Portsmouth area with kids playing in the streets without shoes also included the most truly unforgettable visit to the RMS Aquitania, combined with also witnessing the first scheduled passenger carrying voyage of the then brand new RMS Queen Mary. Subsequently, he was also to witness firsthand the beginning of the Blitz of Portsmouth. All these historical counters clearly leaving their respective indelible impressions upon him. In particular, Biff's earliest pre-war recollections of the Great Liners are accounted as follows. My earliest memory of Queen Mary was in May 1936, when I was taken by my parents with my sister Pat from Portsmouth, where we lived to Southampton, especially to see the great ship depart on a maiden voyage. She was due to sail to Sherbrooke on that day, which I assume, therefore, must have been the 27th of May. This is an especially treasured memory, made all the more remarkable, as on the same day we also visited the RMS Aquitania for a full guided tour. The family had made the journey to Southampton by paddle steamer, and in the frenetic rush for everyone to secure the best initial view of the majestic Titan meant that the huge mass of passengers had all crowded to one of the ship's sides, causing the paddler to list most alarmingly to that side. Olive, Biff's mother, only a slightly built lady, immediately rushed to the opposite side of the steamer in a totally vain but nonetheless comically memorable effort to offset the list. World War II came. Biff was evacuated to Enfield to stay with Uncle Bill and Aunt Grace. Earliest known job was as a butcher's boy, later working in a brush factory, with the grand title of bristle dresser, which meant setting the bristles into the brushes. The most remarkably poignant surviving artefact from this period is a very small dog-eared card entitled Viva St. Nicholas, and dated the 22nd of December 1939, Biff's seventh birthday. This was sent from his dad, universally known as Pop Fricker, during the latter's active service with the British Expeditionary Force. Due to the obvious requirements of ongoing operational constraints, 
Pup's location is simply given with classic military understatement as somewhere in France. Biff's earliest ambitions were to follow his Uncle Bill, warrant officer, into the Royal Marines. But ultimately, Biff opted to join the same corps as had also his father Herbert at a very early stage in World War II, namely the Royal Army Service Corps. Herbert, apart from being a veteran of World War I, was unfortunately just young enough to have to serve again in the current World War. As such, he was part of the Expeditionary Force in France in 1939 as Royal Army Service Corps motorbike dispatch rider and considered himself lucky to have survived the Dunkirk evacuation in May 1940. Biff's brother Mick was also to follow the path of both his father and brother into what was regarded as the Family Corps. Final ranks were Warrant Officer First Class and Staff Sergeant, respectively. Footnote Origin of the family nickname Biff His father Herbert, by peacetime profession a bus driver, was once asked directions by one of his passengers, who just happened to be a Matalo. Thanks Biff, came the reply. This also, much more significantly, just happened to coincide with the occasion of Morris's birth, and the nickname stuck, lasting literally a lifetime and even beyond. Just as well, really, as Biff never really cared for any of his given names. Boy Service Volunteer enlisted during World War II Home Theatre, 1944-48 Biff joined the Army on the 21st of August, 1944, as number T10-714-376, enlisting at High Cross, London. Initial training was given at Clayton Barracks, Aldershot, signing up for eight years total in the Colours and four years in the Reserve. As only 14 years old, he entered boy service for a three-year period, initially wearing the Dancing Dogs, the Royal Coast of Arms of the General Service Corps. The vast majority of Biff's time as a boy soldier was spent within the auspices of Training Company, Boys RASC. The regime consisted of general army training, followed by normal training in motor transport. This comprised three basic transport categories. Ambulance section, mostly Austins. Cargo carrying vehicles, mainly Bedford's 1500 CWT and three tonners. Staff car company, primarily Humbers. The boy soldiers were given both general education and also military training. 24th of May 1945, upgraded to Army Second Class Certificate of Education at Aldershot. During spring of 1945, Biff was sent to HM Gunwolf Portsmouth for his introduction into what was universally known as the War Department Fleet. Technically speaking, the War Department Fleet was purely the civilian crewed side of the Army's fleet, whereas the military crewed vessels would actually come under the heading of RASC Water Transport. Both branches of the service using a system of the vessels being allocated to numbered companies. Irrespective of the foregoing debate, both throughout and after his service float, for the record, Biff always used the generic term War Department Fleet to describe the Army afloat, as it was undeniably easier, more succinct and catchier than trying to spout the awkward mouthful RASC WT every time. Physical training was obviously very much an intimate part of the military training regime, including seemingly never-ending long-distance runs. The much-hated physical training instructor was actually French, which obviously didn't help his popularity with the lads. He would incessantly bark, PUNCH HOLE IN YOUR GUTS, in his thick accent, to further chide the poor unfortunate trainees. But notwithstanding the excessive rigours of this most punishing regime, Biff's stature grew many inches in height during this period, and he was, although admittedly much later, actually quite grateful for this considerable physical development. Far more pleasant training was the initiation into HM Gunwolf Portsmouth, from which a subsequent lifelong association would always endure. Biff recalled at least one war-impressed WD trawler 
alongside the Gunwolf during his first most memorable World War II visit. Biff was actually to be embarked in RESC Benson, a former Fairmile B War Office ambulance launch, which by that stage was employed as a training ship. She was attached to 615 Company and manned by a military crew. Benson was the former Royal Navy Motor Launch 908, and she had only just been handed over to the Army that May and was built by James Taylor of Chertsey. These Fairmile type launches were examples of a generic type of which many hundreds had been built, literally worldwide, from prefabricated kits. The military ambulance launches were given a large extra deck house aft, intended to accommodate stretcher cases, as they had been conceived to serve in the planned invasion of Japan. The dropping of the first atomic bombs to end that campaign would ensure that the WOALs never actually saw the Far East service for which they had originally been intended. Although ultimately Benson would end up in the Middle East, as did many of her sisters, it is worth noting that Biff's brother, Mick, actually served in her sister, Shepperton. All these motor launches having been named after locks on the River Thames. Sometime later, Biff would be locally reunited with Benson, but only after her withdrawal from active water transport service. The RASC boy soldier recruits were all given four basic categories of induction training in order that it could be determined which suited them best, or was even perhaps more to their liking. The first of the four training details took place at the 19th century Palmerston Fortress, Fort Victoria at Yarmouth on the Isle of Wight. Here was afforded the opportunity for hands-on experience of a wide variety of army vessels, some still defensively equipped as the war was still very much in progress and the locale was obviously an actively operational area. Many vessels were to be seen alongside Victoria Pier. The highlight of this visit was a pair of high-speed target towing launches, complete and bristling with their defensive machine gun armament and included a memorable trip to sea in one of these. The other vessels comprised a 90-foot motor fishing vessel, MFV, and two smaller 61-foot sisters. 36-foot harbour launches were also evident, ubiquitous maids of all work, as they were utilised throughout the RASC fleet worldwide. The second training was for induction into the operation of military amphibious vehicles, this took place at Towin in North Wales and took about one week. DUKWs and Buffaloes were the vehicles concerned. The DUKW training consisted of both ashore and afloat exercises, whereas the Buffalo work was mostly done afloat. Thirdly came the air dispatch trip, and undoubtedly one of the most exciting training details for the young recruits. This comprised a one and a half weeks introductory course for boy soldiers. This afforded the unique opportunity to experience a variety of the Army's aircraft, which were then very much still on in frontline service. Biff's training at the airfield of RAF Newark, Nottingham, included taking to the air in horse gliders and also a couple of flights in Dakota transport planes. The aircraft crews recounted to the boys their recent first-hand experiences of having lived to tell the tales of their exploits during the infamous raid on Arnhem, later to be immortalised in the movie as A Bridge Too Far. This experience obviously made an enormously great impression upon Biff. He was later to fly greatly all around the globe and became a much seasoned and experienced flyer, always enjoying and appreciating such experiences and the groundwork was most assuredly laid during these first formative but austere wartime air dispatch training flights. The fourth and final phase of induction training took Biff back to Wales. The location was a military fuel tank farm near Cardiff. It involved the intricacies and the technicalities of the operation of fixed fuel tank installations and static fuel supply. This comprised learning the main categories of the principles of fuel storage, safety and delivery of the same. Whilst obviously vital to the running of any worldwide support infrastructure, in general the term logistics being still a long way from being coined, 
and to the ongoing war effort in particular, this last trading stint cannot have failed to have registered as comparatively dull next to the previous exciting exploits on sea, land and in the air. Needless to say, Biff did not opt for an army career in fixed fuel tank installations. With the thoughts of Biff's enjoyable visit to his first ever army vessel, Dear Benson, still very much uppermost in his mind, the first option was naturally chosen. The platoon officer was therefore informed of the decision of which category of service Bill had opted to train for. This necessitated a move to Buller Barracks. The classroom used had been converted to a water transport training section. It had its own WT instructor, Corporal William Hatton, with whom began a personal association with Bill that was to enjoy both throughout and even after the course of his career. One particular boy service tale may be related here. It occurred when Biff was then a boy sergeant and had to be temporarily billeted. He was finally quartered in the regular sergeant's mess, much to the complaints and consternation of the other ranks regulars. But any complaints and sour grapes were utterly to no avail. The chevrons were deemed, and indeed actually did, decide the matter entirely, irrespective of the recipient's age. At the war's end, several notable sites presented themselves and are eminently worthy of inclusion at this juncture. One recollection in general being that the apparently limitless lines of defunct surplus World War II naval tank landing ships, LSTs, laid up abreast, lining the shores of the Titna Lake foreshore and stretching far into the distance. Whilst in terms of venerable naval war horses in particular, the imposing sight of the redundant HMS Warspite laid up at the Solent capital ship Mooring Boys was a truly unforgettable one. Biff specifically recalled seeing her still complete with her conspicuous and characteristic Admiral's Walk at the stern, the last such survivor in the Navy. Isle of Wight at age 17 and a half in the summer of 1946, Biff was to be posted to the distinctively hexagonal Golden Hill Fort at Freshwater, Isle of Wight. Biff was due to have immediately begun the water transport training course. However, unfortunately, he was late on joining, the current course having already started. Hence, Biff was to serve very briefly as a regimental policeman thereby adding a further category of experience to his fledgling military career. In the only known surviving atmospheric photo from this particular period, depicts Biff in battle dress with beret, webbing belt and gaiters, sporting the regimental policeman's armband on his right arm. This photo also gives further insight into fort life in the immediate post-war years. Biff is seen standing on duty at the gatehouse in Golden Hill Fort, whilst behind him are the edges of the adjacent stone steps and also the surround to the inset cast iron foot scraper is noticeably immaculately picked out in white paint in the finest long-standing military tradition. This photo has also preserved another facet of daily fort life and always the absolute utmost priority for the morale of any serviceman, the mail service. Biff stands directly in front of the fort's mailbox inset into the brick wall. After serving his brief term as a regimental policeman, Biff was finally able to start his chosen profession. First came the seaman and galley cook's course. Biff had always had a natural aptitude for cooking and was to become a most highly competent cook, a lifetime source of pleasure not just for Biff, but also fortunately for the entire family. Every seaman had to pass the galley cook's course. The training was on the primary fuel of the time, the coal-fired galley stove. This training was done at the galley cook's school, which was specifically equipped with an installation comprising of a half dozen cookers. As with so many water transport trainees, Biff cut his boat handling teeth on board the Barracks Lines Class General Service Launch, RASCV Corona. A couple of other craft were also allocated for this purpose. The general boat handling consisted of the usual circuits and bumps, 
and also anchor handling work using either this class of general service launch or the 36 foot harbour launches. This was supplemented by occasional training embarked in the much larger and sturdier 61.5 foot MFVs. Overall this training period ran for the better part of a five month period. The catering training ran concurrently with that of the seamanship. MFV 160 was one of several 61.5 foot classmates based at Yarmouth in 1946 to 1947. At this early period the vessels were moored at buoy trots between the pier and the harbour. The MFVs were used for short local training courses. Classes of soldiers under training would report to Fort Victoria and take a dinghy to pick up the allocated vessel. By 1950-51 it was believed that 160 was actually the last survivor of her length operated here when by that stage the vessels were moored within the harbour itself at the first trot. Certainly for the much larger sister, MFV 1502, it is known that her regular training cruises would include Weymouth and the Channel Islands amongst her ports of call, a routine she would amazingly sustain for over four decades. The most distinctive vessel which was recalled being served in at this period was Minka 35, as she, like Arctic 2, which was to replace her some years later, formed such a uniquely significant part of the background to the water transport scene. The Minka barge, or just the Minka, as she was generally known, was such a massive, totally timber construction that she could not have failed to impress those who had been billeted in her by the sheer wonder of her magnificent solid construction. Apart from colossal solid timber build, about the only other fact of her career, which was then generally appreciated by her crew, was her Canadian origins. Only nearly 60 years later was she finally to give up some further secrets of her type and significance to the war effort as a whole, which the Minka barges represented, because originally these sterling craft had once been part of the vital amphibious invasion fleet, there being both powered and dumb versions. Biff recalled her in service in situ as late as 1948, but by the time of his return in 1955 to take over in charge of the barge, Minka had already been replaced by Arctic 2, yet another Noah's Ark lookalike. Another enduring memory of Yarmouth were the RESC's military oil barges. These ungainly vessels earned a somewhat notorious reputation due to their habit of perpetually breaking down thereby often necessitating being towed back into port by Yarmouth's resident lifeboats, a rather humiliating process, needless to say. The MOB's pennant numbers were conspicuous by their prominence on the local lifeboat station's Sea Rescues tally board. Pubs These have been quite uncharacteristically totally omitted from this narrative of service life thus far so will be rectified forthwith. In terms of Yarmouth, the RASC military boats crews mainly used the beautiful and historic Bugle Inn. Biff was to revisit this old haunt many times in later years. An exhaustive listing of the pubs frequented by the army's fleet would no doubt make interesting reading in its own right. Sadly, no such publication is known to exist. But for the sake of completeness of these notes, it would just be worth putting on record here that the Plymouth military boats crews extensively used the Admiral McBride on the Barbican, though no doubt not exclusively. For liquid refreshment for crews based at HM Gun Wharf, Portsmouth, first-hand testimony identifies the Eagle, adjacent to St George's Square, and the Seagull, near the Camber Docks, as among the official haunts of civilian and military crews respectively. The Horseshoe, adjacent to the roundabout in Old Portsmouth, was yet another regular haunt recalled in the memories of soldier-sailors of the Old Army Fleet. Sadly, the latter pub no longer exists, but at least the name is perpetuated by the block of flats which replaced it on site. On the 6th of December, 1947, the following entry was penned into Biff's record and paybook. Past Waterman 
985 Company RASC Class D3. Additionally, on Biff's 18th birthday, the 22nd of December 1947, he was granted one star pay. The waterman's qualification signified that the holder was fully entitled and qualified to serve in the capacity of seaman on board a Royal Army Service Corps vessel. The craft concerned was to be Sykes, a practically brand new Dickens class general service launch of the Series 2. The boat herself had only just been completed and taken on charge during the course of late July of the previous year. Sykes was then based at Yarmouth, serving as a training ship. For these training details, Sykes would operate daily from Victoria Pier. By night, Sykes would traverse the Solent and moor at Lymington. The range of the training cruises were confined to passages and port visits within the Solent area. Generally speaking, most of Sykes' training details were for seamanship training, although she was interspersed with occasional officers' short course for introduction to water transport. The most notable and memorable Sykes recollection occurred during one of these routine training exercises, when a spontaneous salute from one of the smallest war department vessels was made by providing an unofficial escort to the undisputed flagship of the Merchant Navy, the RMS Queen Mary herself. Recounting in Biff's own words, My next close encounter with the Queen Mary occurred in the second half of 1947, when serving in a small military general service launch, a Dickens-class vessel named Sykes. We were on exercises off the Isle of Wight, being only 50 foot in length, and after sighting the Great Queen, decided to give her an unofficial escort by literally following in her wake from the Needles Lighthouse until well into the Solent. Thus one of the smallest British World War II ships had paid her tiny tribute to one of the largest. Thus ended his time in Sykes, which Biff quite fondly remembered as he liked both her class and obviously also her area of operation, being his home patch as it were. Thereafter ensued billeting at embarkation camp, awaiting his first posting for overseas service, the location concerned being Thetford in Norfolk. Far East Theatre Far East Land Forces, 1948-1951 Singapore The ensuing sea passage must have stood out in vivid contrast to the previous pleasant experience serving in Sykes. The story is taken up in Biff's own apposite and succinct description of life aboard a utilitarian troopship of the time, most of which, it has to be said, were all pretty much as bad as each other. 13th March 1948. Sail for Singapore in HMT Lancashire from Liverpool. Disgusting. Cramped. Insanitary. Uncomfortable. Food disgusting. Top bunk. Out and back. Empire Orwell. Four weeks passage. Steaming 13 to 14 knots. As with all experiences, whether good or bad, and this was most definitely of the latter category, finally the voyage came to an end. The old trooper had sailed by way of Suez, the first of many future visits, Aden and Colombo. On arrival at Singapore, there was no time to acclimatise to the prevailing sweltering tropical conditions. Biff had to report to the Nissan Transit Camp on Singapore Island, this was a single water transport draft, but as Biff was, had already experienced at joining Golden Hill Fort, the timing of initial joining instructions was not always choreographed with perfection. The RASC's original intention was for Biff to join the sleek Thornycroft high-speed target towing launch Armentiers, but on arrival Biff was to discover that she was out of action due to a variety of problems primarily her main engines. On going ashore, Badge, as Biff was always known in the service due to having started army life as a boy soldier, was to bump into a very familiar face. 
namely Bill Hatton, his old water transport instructor in boys service. Bill was by then a warrant officer second class, master of a Mark IV tank landing craft, namely LCT 1060. After exchanging pleasantries and bringing their respective stories up to date, Bill asked Biff whether he would like to join his LCT. Clearly Biff needed no further encouragement as he joined LCT 1060 immediately. This obviously represented a colossal step up in terms of both tonnage and complexity in ship handling compared with those hitherto experienced. So far Biff had served in the following types. Harbour launch, Barracks Lines General Service launch, Dickens General Service launch, and both standard types of motor fishing vessel utilised at Yarmouth, namely the 61.5 and 90 footers. He had also experienced brief encounters with the pedigreed Fairmile 112 foot motor launch and the smaller high speed target towing launch. But the Mark IV LCT was a much different kettle of fish from those smaller, all wooden vessels. Heavy, steel, and flat bottomed, they displaced nearly 600 tonnes at full load and measuring just shy of 190 feet overall length. This was the naval amphibious made of all work which had so recently performed such an outstandingly sterling war role both at D-Day and in the Mediterranean. Indeed, all the RESC Mark IVs based at Singapore had only fairly recently been transferred from the Royal Navy, most of them having seen a wide variety of action and exploits in the Mediterranean under the White Ensign. After being declared surplus from the Navy, the War Office found these LCTs extremely gainful further service both at home and abroad. These Far East Mark IVs were to prove the longest lived of all the Army's war-served LCT tonnage, their role finally being transferred to the ultimate evolution of the type, namely the even larger Mark VIII. The very same LCT fours which both Biff and later his brother Mick were to serve in were quite remarkably still actively seagoing well into the 1960s. The change of direction in Biff's career away from the smaller vessels was eventually to herald quite rapid advancement through the ranks and qualification grades as it was not long after joining 1060 that Biff was actually to be promoted to mate. Much personal training ensued, and this was marked by a subsequent draft change to LCT-742, one of 1060's sisters, a vessel for which Biff had a particular soft spot. For example, he always recalled with fondness her distinctive green and sily weir builder's plate, which she still proudly carried on board. Most of the LCTs didn't have such grandiose fittings as builder's plates. Biff also stood by Mark IVs during their refitting and docking in Singapore. LCT decks took seriously heavy punishment whilst transshipping tanks, heavy vehicles and other equipment, hence the deck plating wore out remarkably quickly, necessitating regular replating work. Biff is featured in a photo, has to be either 1948 or 1949, swimming with two colleagues, the views to seaward and a couple of small islands are visible. The smaller one in the centre of the picture, the larger extreme left, it is captioned thus, taken on November 17th, just off a place called Belakang Mati. Belakang Mati means Island of the Dead. By this stage, Bifford also briefly served as mate in 742. What Biff's living conditions serving on such World War II vintage, non-air-conditioned tonnage leave absolutely nothing to the imagination, in particular the loss of the poor unfortunate ship's engineers, both in terms of humidity and noise, is practically beyond both imagination and sheer human endurance. Even in the 1980s, the so-called Bukom factor still persisted, in other words, the island's interminable plague unaccountable technical problems, consecutive excessive cargo handling delays, not to mention the also literally overpowering stench of both black, heavy and white 
light fraction oils. LCT 742 has a most distinguished claim to fame as she was one of only a handful, actually only six, LCTs to be depicted in the Southampton D-Day embroidery. The latter was originated by LCM Sandal, designed by Katrina M. Christensen and embroidered by Southampton Women's Guild. Unfortunately, 742 never actually took part in the Normandy landings herself, so the reason why her number should have been chosen to be immortalised in the famed embroidery remains obscure. Notwithstanding the foregoing, the whole of the famous War Department trio, namely 742, 1060 and 1111, certainly did see Royal Navy active service in World War II, actually in the Malayan Theatre in 1944 as part of two assault convoys totalling 48 LCTs, which sailed from Mandapam 29th to 30th of August to arrive at the Mora Beachhead 9th of September 1944. One absolutely priceless LCT dit has to be recalled here. One of these War Department LCT-4s had been tasked with cargo transshipment from alongside an Alfred Holt Blue Funnel, Blue Flu, line freighter. As the LCT came alongside, the rather imperious deck officer on watch had actually the temerity to condescendingly refer to the LCT as a mere barge. Obviously, Biff took exceptionally great delight in correcting the officer's elementary mistake as to the identification of vessel nomenclature as to her actually being a tank landing craft and not a barge. But actually the working relationship between the war department and the merchant navy vessels was generally a good one. Singapore was graced with so many of the liveries and house flags of the well-known shipping lines of the period, but in particular the magnificent Benline boats were recalled with a special fondness. These were beautiful Chinese crude vessels always immaculate despite their highly labour-intensive, distinctive wood-grain effects of the Upper Works paint scheme. But actually, all this LCT experience, as valuable as it was, had really been by way of a time filler away from his initially allotted sea draft, because by that stage, the high-speed target towing launch Armentiers had actually completed a refit. So by then, Bill Hatton had left 1060, and Biff's time in 742 had also finished. Finally, Biff was able to take up his originally allocated draft, along with Bill, to this Thornycroft Battler, as this battlefield type was nicknamed. During this time, Armentiers was permanently moored in the Thornycroft's yard at Tangjong Ru, being put through her paces as part of an extensive series of sea trials. She was personally allocated as the Commander-in-Chief's personal launch. As such, Armentiers was always most beautifully bulled up, her towing winch having been removed for this role, her brass work being immaculately polished at all times. Bill Hatton had been promoted to Warrant Officer First Class as Master, whilst Biff was serving as Mate. Eventually, her persistent mechanical problems were finally solved and the launch was deemed fit to return to the service of the Commander-in-Chief. During the week, the General's senior staff were embarked aboard a proving run to the island of Bali, within the Dutch East Indies, in the Malacca Strait. As a result of this proving run, the launch was considered fully satisfactory, hence the crew of the Armentiers prepared for her forthcoming voyage, which was to embark the General on the following Sunday. Early on what was to ultimately prove to be a particularly fateful Sunday morning, Armentier slipped her moorings at Tanjong Ru. En route, she struck the submerged wreck of a Dutch liner, which had been sunk in the early part of the war. The impact completely wrote off the propellers and rudders of the once thoroughbred target tower, now rendered lifeless, and the battler was quite literally battling to stay afloat herself. The International Code Flag Group, November Charlie, was promptly hoisted to indicate to all vessels in the vicinity that she was indeed quite literally a vessel in immediate distress. To cut a very long story short, 
Armentiers was fortunately eventually recovered, having been towed and supported between the two LCTs 1060 and 1111. She was then beached stern first at Pulau Brani. Eventually, she would receive a major refit to restore her back to seagoing condition, only to survive subsequent close shaves when on target towing duties. She was straddled with shells fired by the range ashore, which narrowly missed exploding her high-octane fuel tanks. The fully unexpurged version of this very famous incident is recounted at length in the podcast of this series entitled The Armentiers Incident. At this juncture, several further vessels should be added to the record, as they were also very much part of Biff's Singapore scene at the time. The first of these is the 90-foot motor fishing vessel 1514. She was 1502's sister, which had been earlier encountered at Yarmouth, Isle of Wight. By Biff's time in Singapore, she had already been withdrawn from army service and was therefore laid up. But she was still well renowned for having earlier hit the jetty as a result of a mechanical mishap and the resulting impacts having pushed back the stem post several feet. Considering the colossal strength of this type, this must have been a most spectacular impact indeed. A fellow historic War Department World War II motor fishing vessel was also recalled from this time, but she was actually two classes smaller than the 90-foot motor fishing vessel, namely being a 61.5 footer. What made her especially unusual was that she was one of the rare examples with a distinctive detached wheelhouse right forward. A small number of this type of MFE had been fitted out this way to enable enhanced access to the stretcher cases as their wartime role had been part of that of an ambulance fleet. Her identity was always recalled as being MFV 50 and there is certainly no doubt whatsoever that 50 did indeed serve in Singapore but there still remains uncertainty whether 50 was actually the detached wheelhouse example. Malaya After the target tower, Biff was transferred back to LCT 1111, initially as mate, subsequently receiving his first command of an LCT on board this vessel. 1111 was employed on the particularly hazardous and also very hard manual work of ammunition dumping around the south and east coasts of Malaya, but she also performed in her designed amphibious frontline task of making beach landings. It was in these two roles that she was to serve during the Malayan emergency. In the course of supporting the latter, she worked along the east coast of Malaya, primarily Johor State, but also a couple of others. Further insight into the typical amphibious support activities provided by LCT 1111 and her Mark IV sisters is given by a surviving sailing order to that ship, then rated as an ammunition dumping craft. It was signed by the renowned Captain Goodyear Page, then Captain Operations, for officer commanding 986 Company RASC at the island of Pulau Brani with a DTG of the 17th of May 1950 at 15.03 hours. The address reveals that 1111 was under sailing orders to beach at Belia Creek at 1000 hours the following day. Here she was to load rations and accommodation stores and also 200 gallons of petroleum oil lubes. By 1300 the ship was to be ready to proceed to sea at 14.10 some 58 to 90 personnel were to be embarked from the ever-present and ever-faithful harbour launches. Departure time was set for 1600, thence for the ship to proceed to a position three miles south of Mersing, the ETA being given at 0700 hours, 19th of May, 1950. The course was from Singapore to Johor Shoal and thence to the beachhead. It was noted that leading marks and a marker boy had been placed on the beach south of Mersing. Reciprocal tracks were to be used for the LCT's return to Singapore. It was further advised that in the event of adverse weather conditions, the master should use his discretion as to taking shelter. 
Jason Bay was identified as being the only suitable sheltering water available on the northbound course. Liaison between 1111's master and the senior officer president was encouraged to enable the highest possible degree of comfort for the troops embarked. Fortunately, not all duties were totally of an operational nature. Less arduous tasks, including showing the flag by the ADC's participation in Navy Weeks, along with such notable vessels such as the Yangtze Incident, veteran frigate HMS Amethyst, and also fellow former LCT MRC maintenance repair craft 1401, formerly LCT 341, which had been converted with conspicuous bow horns to help facilitate her useful role. But life was not always composed of just purely hard-working routine at sea, and in particular, Biff took great pleasure in relating the following tale. During one especially memorable run ashore in Singapore, Biff met up with a deck officer from the magnificent Dutch liner Willem Ruiz. As both the Orange and Ruiz used to make fleeting overnight visits to Singapore on their way to Jakarta in the Dutch East Indies. Biff was invited on board the Ruiz for a quite lovely evening meal. This was a really luxurious and most appreciated, rarely agreeable perk of the Singapore scene of that period. The same liner was later to be personally encountered by Biff again in the Red Sea after her collision with her running mate, QV. Hong Kong Biff continued to serve in 1111 until October 1950. He was then posted to Hong Kong, sailing from Singapore in the War Department steam-towered tank landing ship Mark III Maxwell Brander. Upon arrival, Biff joined 1874 Water Transport Platoon. Here, the duties he was allocated to perform were acting as the General's coxswain in various river-class fast launches, including the much-renowned Humber and also skippering the Dickens twos on range-clearing tasks. Biff was also detailed to instruct Chinese other ranks as seamen to handle the wooden ramped cargo lighters. During his time in Hong Kong, Biff was notably to meet up with Morris Bright, with whom he was to share the intricacies of beach landings in the resident landing craft mechanised LCM Mark VII. Morris Bright had not previously performed this operation before, and together the two struck up a genuine and true friendship, which was ultimately to literally endure the course of a lifetime. As a relevant footnote, Morris Bright deemed it an honour to attend Biff's committal at sea in the Solent from a serving army vessel. Nothing could have been more appropriate than the ramped craft logistic allocated, as she was indeed the lineal successor to the World War II LCM, in which they had served together nearly 56 years earlier. Biff's first tour of duty in the Far East was finally drawing to a close. Christmas was duly celebrated in the colony, and on Boxing Day 1950, this time the troop ship he was to be embarked on was of German origin, the elegant, externally at least, twin-funnelled HMT Empire Orwell, 17,362 tonnes. It was doubtless with some relief that her accommodation was found to be slightly better than that of the Lancashire's previously experienced, though it sounds as if the latter's notoriously poor living standard would have been difficult to have been exceeded. Following Hong Kong, Biff returned to the UK for some well-deserved disembarkation leave before returning to service abroad. In the next brief instalment, we will cover the Armentieres incident in full as written by Biff himself. We will then pick up in part two where we left off here. Thanks for listening to this podcast episode from Mosquito Nautica. If you like the show and want to know more, check us out on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram. Please leave us a review on whichever podcast app you use. We'll be regularly releasing content, so if you subscribe you'll get the updates and won't miss out. Thanks very much. Catch you next time.